typical symptoms of Lyme disease. Very important for those of us recovering from chronic disease because Lyme infections are associated with chronic disease very, very often. So today the topic is atypical symptoms of Lyme disease. If we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. This topic is really important because for those of us recovering from multiple sclerosis or other neurological diseases, Lyme or Borrelia or the, in the infections associated with Lyme disease are really, really common. They're one of the infections that are present and causing our symptoms. And we'll talk about the more traditional symptoms. There are a lot of symptoms that we can get from these different infections associated with Lyme disease, but some of them are atypical. Some of the symptoms of Lyme disease, you wouldn't suspect that it would be from Lyme disease. And so this, and I see this in our students. So if we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha and I have a program, it's called the Live Disease Free Academy. I myself have recovered from multiple sclerosis and I coach other people, I help them to build a game plan to recover also. So we have a lot of insights into the types of infections that are causing MS symptoms and not just MS, but other diseases, especially neurological diseases. You guys are all here, awesome. So again, the topic today would be atypical symptoms of Lyme disease. As we are recovering from MS or other chronic diseases, we may have some really strange symptoms. Like one of my students recently has a lot of hiccups. And what's so interesting is that it may not only always be caused by Borrelia or the infections associated with Lyme, that can be one of the causes. Um, hiccups can be caused by Borrelia or by the, the tick-borne infections. So it helps us to really appreciate why we're suffering with these different symptoms and how varied they can be. So with respect to Lyme disease, there is a huge link between Lyme disease and multiple sclerosis. And there are studies dating back all the way to 1911. We have a lot of those studies posted on livediseasefree.com. After this video, make sure to go over to livediseasefree.com and take a peek at them. Science can be confusing sometimes, but we put it all together there so you can just scan it. And you can see that in 1957, Time Magazine actually wrote an article about a bacteriologist who found these corkscrew bacteria, which are Lyme, in the central nervous system of people that have MS. And all the way back to 1911, they were finding these spirochetes. So, so that would be a bacteria that is in the shape of a corkscrew, and that would be Borrelia. So it's very important for us to treat these infections and to be aware that they are present. And we've talked, if you've watched some of my other videos, where Dr. Alan McDonald found that these small nematodes, they contain Borrelia, which is the, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, and they are infecting, these worms are infecting us with Lyme in our central nervous system. So sometimes we might think of just traditional symptoms of Lyme. So some of those would be, I just kind of put them here for you. So if we are bitten by an insect that infects us with the vector-borne infections, we may have a fever, we may have chills, we may have fatigue, we might get headaches, we might get muscle or joint pain, we might even have swollen lymph nodes, and sometimes, but not usually, a bullseye rash. So that is a typical rash, but it's more often if we have been infected by these biting insects more than once. So with the first infection or being infected with the Lyme disease infections, it is not necessarily and usually we don't get a bullseye rash. Really important to know that. So just because we don't get a bullseye rash does not mean that we were not infected with these Lyme disease infections. So when I say the vector-borne infections, it's not just one microbe that causes Lyme disease. There is Borrelia, which is the bacteria that is traditionally 
understood to be the biggest part of Lyme, but there are often there are many other microbes that travel together when we're bitten by these insects. And it's not just the ticks, it would be mosquitoes and horse flies and fleas from our cats, any biting insect. So there is Borrelia, but there's also Babesia, which is a protozoa, and it's really common with multiple sclerosis. And there are also uh, Bartonella and Ehrlichia, and there's many others that travel together. So we may have Borrelia, but we may have other different uh, tick-borne or vector-borne infections also. Very important to understand. So I shared with you just some of the common symptoms that people might notice if they were just recently bit by a tick or a biting insect. But for many of us, we maybe we had some symptoms, but we just kind of thought, oh, it's just the flu or whatever. And we didn't have it checked, didn't have it treated. And we end up with a chronic state where we've had these infections for a long time. I just wanna make sure that my volume is up nice and high here. Ah, yes, it's perfect. So, so with respect to Lyme, and this is what caused me to think of doing this Facebook Live, is that one of my students in Europe, she said, I have these terrible, terrible hiccups. They just don't go away. And, and I know that there's a huge link between Borrelia and Lyme and MS. And so I thought I would look at the research and sure enough, there have been case studies where, and I'll just share them with you, actually, I'll go to it right now, with some very unusual symptoms caused by Lyme disease. So the first one I wanted to talk about is a 2019 study, and there were two case studies presented here. So this is a, a peer-reviewed study. Number one, the case is that there was a patient who came in and had low sodium levels in her blood. It's very important that our body maintains a specific amount of sodium in our blood because that really impacts the flow of fluid inside of us. So with lower than normal sodium salt in our blood, then we end up where the um, fluid is going to be rushed. So if we have less salt in our blood, then fluid is going to move out into our tissue and into our brain and our central nervous system. So we can get swelling. And some of you may know that you deal with swelling. So something like this, a bacterial infection can cause this type of edema, swelling, etc. but also seizures, muscle twitches, and I mentioned the brain dysfunction. So this was a 62 year old woman who had a history. So she wasn't the healthiest person. She had a history of stomach cancer. She had fatty liver, uh, non-alcoholics, fatty liver, gallbladder issues, stones, mild depression. She came in and she had general weakness and confusion, dizziness and back pain. And she also had mild tachycardia. So her heart rate was elevated high, a little bit elevated blood pressure and pain and muscle weakness. The doctor noticed that she had lower than normal salt in her uh, blood test. So he gave her an IV infusion of saline to help to try to bring that back up because that's not a good situation to have. But it didn't help. The IV did not help at all. So then he, the doctor gave her a stronger solution. And um, three days after the admission, she also started to develop eyelid, her, her left eyelid closed. She started to get facial paralysis and speech impairment, and she was becoming more and more weak. And they tested her for Borrelia, and she tested positive with the Western blot. They put her on antibiotics. And so, oh, I should say too, that with the second infusion of salt, they still could not get her salt levels normal in her blood. And then she was starting to get all those other neurological symptoms. And so then they ended up testing her for Lyme and she it came back positive, so confirmed Lyme disease. And then they started to treat her with antibiotics and within three days, um, her, uh, I should say the sodium levels started to normalize and within three days. And so then after a few days, they normalized. So that is obviously more than likely, no, Borrelia, because she tested positive for it and she was on an antibiotic. And then her the only way they could get her salt levels normal again was through treating Borrelia. 
So that's an example of how Lyme can cause swelling, can cause more fluid to be going into the brain. We can get swelling in the brain. We can get swelling in the tissues. Her heart rate was up. Her blood pressure was up. So interesting. And then another case study on that same uh, article, a 52-year-old man, he had higher blood pressure. He came in with a high fever and he had incurable hiccups uh, for about three days before. And so he was evaluated and uh, 14 days before that he came in and he had a flu, he had flu-like symptoms, fever and tachycardia. Again, this is another atypical that the, it Lyme disease can affect the heart for sure. So increased heart rate. So the doctor prescribed antibiotics and the symptoms improved and this the patient got baclofen for the hiccups, which is interesting because we, the doctors and neurologists will prescribe baclofen for um, the spasms, for example, that we would have in our legs too. And then they also did some other testing and they found that he didn't have tumors and he didn't have lesions in his brain, but he did have brain inflammation. And the patient remembered that he was bitten by a tick 35 to 40, 35 to 40 days before he started to get these symptoms. So again, it's not necessarily that we get the symptoms right after the bite. And so he was finally diagnosed with tick-borne encephalitis, so swelling in the brain with secondary resistant hiccups. And so as he was treated, then all these symptoms normalized, which is awesome. So there's an example of uncontrollable hiccups that are caused by swelling in the brain, which is caused by a bacterial infection, Borrelia, or the co-infections, the tick-borne infections. Another case study, a 69-year-old healthy jogger in the US, she had a four-day history of right eye pain with progressive drooping of her right eyelid, upper eyelid, and she um, had fever and fatigue during the two days before, but no other symptoms of Lyme disease. So it gets to be really confusing and really difficult for doctors to figure all of this out. She also had a history of, um, no, actually, let me see, oh, we're moving on here. Um, let's see. Yes, no, that was it. So for that study, that lady, that the patient, that's all that she went in with was just, she had a fever and progressively drooping right upper eyelid and they treated her for Lyme also. So that was a 2009 study. And then another study that I saw, optic neuritis and Borrelia. So for myself, I was diagnosed with optic neuritis. That was my first symptom of MS. Other atypical symptoms would be the heart. So this is where we can get irregular heart rhythms. And so this is where maybe they would want to give us uh, the pacemaker and maybe it is just a bacterial infection, which I'm sure often it is. I wanted to share a few others. So there's a really great Can Lyme website and they have a lot of different symptoms listed there, but maybe you have jaw pain or maybe you have hidden dental infections, dental problems, jaw stiffness. Those would be some things that would not necessarily cause us to think of the Lyme disease right away. How about floaters? Many of us get floaters swelling around our eyes and also like sensitive to different types of lights and then our ears buzzing and ringing in our ears that tinnitus and bladder lime la brilia loves the bladder so interstitial cystitis and just urinary tract infections and urgency GERD stomach upset let's see what else here endocarditis so the, all of the different types of heart issues, heart blockage, women, hormones. Like a lot of times when my students start working with me, they have night sweats and day sweats and they swear that it's their hormones. They swear that it's like perimenopause or menopause or just hormonal imbalances. And I always say to them, I say, it's probably just symptoms of these infections. And as you treat them, you'll probably notice that these symptoms will go away and they always do. So it's not usually hormonal imbalances. It's usually these infections causing it. And then again, the heart palpitations and extra beats, maybe irregular heartbeat. And then of course, uh, Lyme 
I can't remember if it's called Lyme rage or Lyme anger, but uh, just real big mood swings, etc. Severe anxiety, panic attacks, excessive crying, feeling really, really overly emotional and sleep issues. That's very common too with our students. So those are just a few. Um, and then also another big one is where symptoms come and go. Maybe you notice that your symptoms, you know, one day you're great and the next day you have symptoms. So Lyme is notorious for symptoms coming and going. So I just wanted to share those with you because if you are in the process of recovering or wanting to recover from some type of chronic disease, especially neurological diseases like MS or Parkinson's or ALS or PLS, very often the vector-borne or tick-borne infections are associated with causing your symptoms and they have to be treated also. But what's really important is that we treat in a specific order because the vast majority of people have been infected with these infections, the Lyme infections. Why is it that a small percentage of us have these horrible neurological and other atypical symptoms? It is because we have a parasitic burden, we have a fungal overgrowth, and sometimes these parasites are infecting us with the Borrelia and the other vector-borne infections. And so that's why it's really important that we use a strategic approach in our recovery and not just focus on treating Lyme first because then we'll be bit by another insect and we will be re-inoculated and then we'll suffer again if we treat the big parasites, the small parasites, knock back the fungus a lot and then start to treat the smaller bacterial infections, the smaller parasites, etc. Then we have success. Then we have long-term ter success, which is so important. Make sure to type in your questions if you guys have any questions for me. So this, I just thought it was so interesting with the hiccups because this was the first student that I've had that had like hiccups that it like just don't go away and they're just absolutely awful. I think I've covered everything there. So I'm just gonna go say hi to you. I also wanted to mention that if you enjoy what I share and teaching you so that you understand what infections you have to treat so that you can recover like the wellness champions and like myself have. Make sure to like this video and if you are on YouTube, hit the notification bell and subscribe so that you'll know when I'm releasing and when I'm live, you can answer, you can ask questions. And then also, if you are new to all of this, then please go to our website, livediseasefree.com and then in the main menu, you'll see research. Then you can click on that and you can look at all the Lyme studies that I've collected there. That's not all of them, but there are a lot. And again, dating back to 1911, connecting MS with Lyme disease. That is very, very amazing. And to, to this day, it's not recognized in our standard of care. But there are more and more doctors understanding that, that these tick-borne or vector-borne infections are definitely causing problems and causing neurological symptoms in not just MS, but also other neurological diseases. So that's the first thing to do is go there, look at the research. You don't have to read it all. You don't have to know how to read research, but you can see the link. You can see that there is a big history. Then um, also under parasites, make sure to watch Dr. Alan McDonald's video about the nematodes that he found in every single uh, specimen that he, t every person that died of 10 out of 10 samples that he looked at, of people that died of MS, tons of worms in their, especially in their spinal fluid. And those worms carry a lot of Borrelia. He showed that through testing and you can see that in his lecture. That is profound. Help me get the word out. Pass that to your doctors, pass it to other groups of MS, like please get that research out. He should well, he should win a Nobel Prize for that because that is incredibly profound. Treating those small nematodes has really been instrumental in helping our students recover from not just MS, but other neurological diseases. So again, if you're new, make sure to check out the research, watch our videos that I have on YouTube and Facebook, Live Disease Free get to know me, look at the worm pictures, all the different videos I have on the infections, the eating plan, start to make changes. And then as your belief really starts to build, 
you're starting to have symptom improvement and you're ready to treat, then make sure to watch my masterclass training, how to recover from MS. And it's not just MS, but I do attract a lot of people that are suffering with MS. Watch that. And if you're ready to be a wellness champion, if you're ready to start building a plan to treat these awful infections, including Lyme disease, then make sure to, at the end of my masterclass, you can click on a link, fill out a form, watch a coachathon, and chat with me, get started, and start to build your pl game plan right away. All right, so I'm just going to check to see if there are any questions here for me. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Hi Mage. Irene, hi Najee, Maurice, you finally made it, Tracy, hello, Valerie, how many of you that suffer with MS have had a positive Lyme test? And remember that unfortunately the Western blot is usually 80% false negative. So if you've had the Western blot and it came back negative, that doesn't mean you don't have Borrelia causing some of your symptoms. Yes. So Facebook user, um, you've helped save my daughter's life. She was diagnosed with MS because she had paralysis, Bell's palsy, lesions all over her brain. She was dying. I stumbled across, oh wow, I stumbled across your video and started to think that she may have an infection. Um, through no doctor would believe us. We finally found a doctor who did and she tested positive for Lyme disease. She took the treatment center, she went to Mexico as well and no more paralysis no more symptoms we thank god oh i'm so thank you so much could you please reach out to me personal message uh, or just please make sure to email us because i just want to connect with you i'm so grateful awesome and sh yes she had uncontrollable hiccups that's amazing uncontrollable that's like this is the second time i've heard that any thoughts on the connection of the spirochetes having an affinity to neural tissue causing mental health issues? Well, all I know is that Lyme, the Borrelia, does not like to live in the blood. So when we're infected, it quickly moves into the tissues. So if we're not treat, so antibiotics will really only help us if we, let's say, we're just infected within a couple of weeks and then we start to use antibiotics because then most of it will be in our blood still. Chronic Lyme is for those of us that are recovering from chronic disease. So the Borrelia will move into deeper into our tissue and into the lymphatic system. And when we have those worms in the central nervous system, they are, every time they die, they're releasing Borrelia into our spinal fluid and our brain. So they can directly get into the brain, but then the worms are also like a Trojan horse and they are carrying these bril the Borrelia and other infections into the brain. So I don't know who you are, but I'm so happy for your daughter. I would really encourage you though to look deeper because in my experience, like I'm glad that the paralysis is gone, but why did she have those symptoms to begin with? Because again, a lot of people are infected with these infections and have no neurological symptoms. So she has more work to do is what I'm saying. If she wants to make sure that she does not have a future uh, flare up of Lyme or symptoms, she's got to look to see, does she have parasites? And there's not a single MS student that I've worked with that is not infested with parasites. So she'll want to treat the parasites and then there's always fungal overgrowth present because of all probably all of the waste material that these lovely worms leave behind. So it's very important to treat the big and the small for long lasting results. So and then yes, mental health issues. It really depends on what part of the brain is affected. So there are certain parts of the brain that affect our mood or our energy or cognitive function, memory, mental clarity, etc. It's so, and it's not always just in the brain. So what's going on in our gut, again, the parasite load in our gut definitely can cause a lot of chemicals. I talked, I think that was last week I talked about it, how our liver tries to detoxify all those chemicals out, but very often it can't. And then it crosses the blood brain barrier, which will cause us to have all kinds of things like mood issues, anxiety, depression, 
lack of focus, all those things. Really important. So yes, this Dr. Alan McDonald should be winning the Nobel Prize. I don't know about the Nobel Prize for sure. I'm not sure which prize, but it is so profound. But what's so frustrating is his research has come out in 2014 and it still is not, most people have not even heard about it. So you guys help me get it out. Please go onto our website, Live Disease Free, go under Parasites, look for his lecture, get that link, send it to your neurologist, send it to your doctor, send it to your different Facebook groups. We've got to start talking parasites because honestly, that is the biggest cause. Hello, Michael. Um, you've had hiccups too. How interesting. Yes, that is, this is a new one for me. I knew about the dental infections and a lot of other peculiar atypical symptoms, but that was definitely new for me also. Um, will the parasite medication kill late stage Lyme pathogens or do you still have to take antibiotics later? Jacqueline, what we have found, and this is through working with amazing doctors like Dr. Klinghard, is that for late stage or chronic Lyme, what he has found, and this is what we see in our students that are most successful, is several treatments of parasites. So at least 14 days of treating parasites and then hitting, knocking back fungus and then taking a little break, doing that over several cycles until people are basically symptom free. On their break week, they definitely can be using antimicrobial herbs, which will kill not just Borrelia, but other bad microbes, because there are other ones that we're not even talking about that we don't even know about. So other bad pathogenic bacteria and small protozoa through different antimicrobial herbs. And for, you know, as we are feeling better and better, and if we do want to, if we've had a lot of symptoms of Lyme, save the 500 to $700 for the test. If you want to spend the money, fine. But if our students have a lot of uh, symptoms of Lyme disease, of Borrelia, et cetera, they will just use like a liposomal herbal preparation. Uh, and that works really well. We don't encourage antibiotic use because I just haven't found it successful. And a lot of people are sensitive to the antibiotics, probably because of the parasites also, but we don't recommend antibiotics for Lyme at all. If it's an acute Lyme infection where somebody has just been bitten, there's high fever, all of that, yes, then they could use it working with the doctor, but otherwise for chronic Lyme, we have not found it really helpful at all. Good question. See if there's any last questions. So do you test your clients muscle response testing biofeedback. So we found more success with number one, the way that our students follow the Live Disease Free Academy is number one, they follow an eating plan where they greatly reduce the food to the infections that are making them sick. So we know that a lot of the parasites and the bacteria, they thrive on carbohydrates and simple sugars. So we're going lower carb, lots of nutrition, but going lower carb. And students start to feel better really quickly. Then after that, we start to support the body. So luckily your daughter probably caught this earlier. And, but a lot of our students have suffered for a long time and they have a lot of disability. And so their body needs support. So we're making sure they're sleeping well. We're making sure they're having daily bowel movements. They're cleaning up certain toxins in the environment, looking at their blood work, supporting their physiology, going through a bunch of things like that. And they're feeling better and better. Then we'll look at their health history, their symptoms, their diagnosis. And then we have samples of the treatments. We don't have them, but we have like a prescription that doctors can write a prescription and they'll often prescribe a single pill of each of the commonly prescribed, prescribed parasite, antifungal, etc. And we don't do the antibiotics. And so they'll get one pill of each of the common ones, and then they'll go to either an, uh, let's say an acupuncturist or a naturopath that can do some type of energy testing or a chiropractor that does applied kinesiology. So they'll take the samples, they'll be tested. And that is really at this time, that is the best way to determine which treatments will be most helpful for the parasites that they have. And we are seeing that it's not a cookie cutter treatment plan for all people with MS, which is frustrating. It would be so nice if we could just say, everyone with MS, you take these two or three parasite drugs and this antifungal drug, and you're going to recover. And unfortunately, that is not the case. We're seeing that 
Students usually test well for three to five parasite drugs and usually one or two antifungal drugs and that they do multiple cycles. And it's shocking what's coming out of them. It's shocking how well they feel. So although this talk was about Lyme, and yes, it definitely can be a problem if it is in a high population in the body, especially getting in the central nervous system, when we want to truly recover from chronic disease, that is not the main culprit. The main culprit are parasites and fungal overgrowth. And fungus is a parasite, but I like to just kind of separate them out. But they are the bigger issue. They are causing the greater amount of toxins. They are suppressing the immune system in a greater way, making us susceptible to the symptoms of the vector-borne infections. So that's why it's best to treat parasites and fungus and then Lyme, and then you'll have more long lasting results. All right, and, and a lot of times we can combine, we can use antimicrobial herbs with the parasite drugs also, but you've got to work with someone. And that's what I help people in the academy is to build the plan, find practitioners, get access to the treatments, and then to take them safely. Because a lot of our wonderful doctors, integrative practitioners that would write prescriptions, they don't have a lot of experience treating parasites. It's ridiculous because parasites have been around forever. We would honestly be better off if we could work with veterinarians, but we can't and they cannot prescribe for us. But they have more experience with the parasite drugs and prescribing them, etc. Hi, Beth. Uh, so Beth McKay, where in Mexico? I'm not, oh, okay, so you're just asking another person. You don't have to go to Mexico to treat Lyme disease. You can treat Lyme wherever you are. I mean, you can go there, but you don't have to. Hi, Teresa. Is there any connection between Lyme and the RA, serial gen, uh, negative RA? I'm not sure. I'm not positive about that, but I can look into that. All I know is that when you start to look at Lyme, that the symptoms are so varied and there is a, there is one thing I want to share with you too, is that there are people that will test positive for some of these vector borne infections, but they are asymptomatic. And that's the important thing is that when you want to recover from chronic disease and you have symptoms, you're not really sure which symptoms are caused by these Lyme infections or which ones are caused by parasites and which ones are caused by fungus. Fungus is another, I've talked a lot about it. I've talked a lot about parasites. And so this is the dilemma we have because there are overlapping symptoms between parasites and Lyme and fungus, etc. And with other diseases, other autoimmune diseases. So I would, I would suspect number one, what I would say is with any autoimmune disease, parasites are involved. This has been my experience and I've worked with over 600 students recovering from chronic disease. So parasites are always involved and the fungal overgrowth is always involved. The Lyme infections would be more so with people that have more neurological symptoms but they probably can be involved in other ways too. So, but a lot of neurological symptoms would be with the Lyme disease or Lyme infections. Yes, joint swelling seems to be, absolutely, is one of them. And to answer that, hello, Michael. I think I've answered most of the questions here. I'm so happy. Thank you for sharing, that's amazing. Last question here. What brand do you suggest or what is the best supplement herbs do for helping the most? I'm not sure what you mean for helping the most for what? For treating Lyme, I know that wormwood is really, really helpful, especially Sweet Annie or artemisinin, which is the extract of Sweet Annie. That is a type of species of wormwood and wormwood is incredible. It's an incredible herb. I grew it for the first time this year. I grew two different varieties and we moved, so I still have them in pots and I got to get them in the ground before. You're very welcome. So I'm going to let you guys go. Next week, I thought it would be really fun to share a case study with you. So I'm going to start doing this, let's say maybe once a month or however often I can fit it in. So this will be a student that is actually in the process of recovering from multiple sclerosis. So you'll have a little bit of background about 
how old she is, what her diagnosis, what symptoms she had, and then her journey, what she's doing and the symptom improvements she's having and the way you'll see the worms that she's passing. And also the, so she's just, I say maybe seven to eight weeks into the program, maybe nine weeks kind of thing. And it is a three month or 12 week program. So you'll see where she's at and how, how the whole journey works in the Live Disease Free Academy. You learn a lot through the experience of other people recovering from MS and from chron other chronic diseases. So it's really exciting. So with that, again, if you enjoy learning about the infections that are causing symptoms, disease symptoms, maybe it's your disease symptoms, or maybe it's you don't have a disease yet, but you're starting to get warning signs, then make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Live Disease Free, hit the notification bell. Please give this a video like and help us get the word out. Please share this video with others. And then if you want to learn more, you can watch lots of videos on YouTube and Facebook, Live Disease Free. You can learn a lot about how to prep, how to get start to get ready. And then when you're ready, make sure to watch my masterclass training and you can become a wellness champion right away within, the, within a few days. You can start this journey on recovery. And so I'll, I'm really excited to share that case study with you next week because you will find it incredibly helpful and inspiring and hopeful. So with that, we will see you next week, five o'clock Pacific on Live Disease Free Facebook and YouTube. Take care and bye-bye for now.